Hello, and welcome to the 10th annual Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies Senior Thesis Research Forum. My name is Ileana Kuzemko, and I'm co-director of the Griswold Center. And I'm very excited to share with you these terrific presentations. The purpose of this forum is to showcase some of the outstanding uh, policy-related research produced by senior thesis students in the economics department. Before getting started, I'd like to thank all of our colleagues for nominating uh, their students uh, and the students both for their hard work on their thesis and uh, for preparing their presentations for us. This year's senior presenters include uh, Christopher Caligari. Chris's thesis focuses on the impacts of taxes imposed on sweetened beverages on price reformulation, consumption, and health outcomes by comparing policies in the Republic of Ireland with those in the United Kingdom. And Chris's thesis advisor is Professor Kate Ho. Tillman Hirschenroder's thesis looks at the political effects of environmental regulation, in particular analyzing evidence from the Clean Air Act. And Tillman's thesis advisor is Professor Janet Curry. Tiger Gao's senior thesis examines the impacts of the debt jubilee in Iceland after the 2008 financial crisis. Tiger's thesis advisor is Professor Atif Nian. Ashraya Kalyanaraman's uh, thesis uh, investigates the extent of statistical discrimination resulting from the removal of uh, from the um, from ban the box, which is the removal of criminal history from job applications. Ishii's uh, thesis advisor is Professor Sarah Heller. Karthik Ramesh's senior thesis explores reshoring and stickiness in the in the apparel and automobile industries following the Trump tariffs. Karthik's uh, advisor is Professor Jean Grossman. Finally, Raymond Juice's uh, senior thesis looks at the transmission of monetary policy in the repo and federal funds markets. Thank you again for tuning into this virtual forum. We hope we can be with you next year in person. And thank you as always for your support of undergraduate research. Hello. My name is Chris Caligari, and I'll be presenting my senior thesis on the impacts of sugar sweetened beverage taxes in Ireland and the United Kingdom. Before I begin, I want to thank everyone who helped me throughout this journey, with a special thanks to my amazing advisor, Kate Ho. First, for a bit of introduction, high sugar consumption is associated with obesity, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. In attempts to address the problem of high sugar consumption, policymakers around the world have begun implementing taxes on sugar sweetened beverages, and 43 countries currently have some form of SSB tax in place. To assess the effectiveness of this policy approach, it is critical to determine how much price, beverage sugar content, and SSB consumption shift following a tax implementation. The taxes in Ireland and the United Kingdom are both tiered systems, meaning that instead of one flat volumetric rate, the taxes have three tiers that a beverage may fall into based on sugar content per 100 milliliters. Pure fruit and vegetable juices, as well as milk-based drinks were excluded from the levies. When a tiered SSB tax is implemented, soft drink manufacturers are incentivized to reformulate their beverages to be within the lower taxed tiers. Consumer demand and manufacturer responsiveness should largely dictate the present day formulation. If many high sugar drinks are still being sold following a supply side price increase, then there is likely relatively inelastic demand for SSBs, a lagged manufacturer response to reformulation, or both. Conversely, if the proportion of sugar in soft drinks decreases, low or no sugar beverages may be closer substitutes for SSBs, and manufacturers are likely more responsive. In my analysis, I worked with three types of data from four different sources. National monthly consumer price index data, annual ingredient volume data for various products in Ireland and the United Kingdom, and consumption data from the Healthy Ireland Survey. 
The monthly CPI panel data spans from January 2015 to September 2020. These two data sets track the relative prices of various goods and services over time. The 22 matching product categories selected were chosen because they were also sold in grocery stores and thus should be subject to many of the same market trends as soft drinks. Euromonitor estimated the ingredient volume of tons sold in each country by using data on consumer level and product sales. Sales weighted data differs from that used by Scarborough et al who employed nutrition label data to interpret changes in UK manufacturing behavior following the tax. Like the CPI data, this data set contains information specifically pertaining to soft drinks in addition to other grocery store items. The pooled cross-sectional consumption data I used for my analysis was retrieved from the Healthy Ireland survey and spans annually from 2015 to 2018. The goal of the survey is to monitor and record the overall health and well-being of the adult Irish population. The study covers topics such as general health, smoking, diet, and physical activity. In an effort to isolate the effect of the tax, I ran difference in difference models to determine the percent rise in price for soft drinks. The treatment group is soft drinks, while the primary control group is the other grocery store products present in the data set. Rather than only setting other untaxed beverages as a control group, as done in Auschwitz et al. study of an SSB tax in Saudi Arabia, I measured how the price of soft drinks changed relative to other grocery store products within each country. There are two main assumptions that DID regressions take on, which I attempt to verify or control for in my analysis. The first assumption is that there are no spillover effects from the tax, which I address by creating substitute and sweet categories to act as controls, as well as the primary control group others that contains all other grocery store items. The second is the parallel trends assumption, which I tested using leads and lags to estimate pre-trends. For the ingredient data, I also examined how tiered sweetened beverage taxes in Ireland and the United Kingdom impacted soft drink ingredient reformulation, measured by a decrease in the percent sugar content. I utilized the DID model similar to the price regressions where soft drinks are the treatment group and all other packaged food products are the controls. The robustness analyses were the same as the price regression as well, which included substitutes and sweets suites control groups in addition to a lead and lag analysis to test for the parallel trends assumption. For the healthy island consumption data, after I cleaned, combined, and recoded questions relevant to various overall categories, I estimated the probability that an Irish survey respondent is a soft drink consumer following the implementation of the tax using a linear probability model. In addition to the three regressions described above, I completed a rough estimation of potential health impacts that people in both Ireland and the United Kingdom face following their respective taxes. Similar to the methodology that Grogger used to estimate the societal health impact of a sweetened beverage tax in Mexico, I used price elasticity measurements gathered from previous literature paired with my own estimated percent price and ingredient results. I first determined what I labeled as the quantity effect which is the decrease in calorie intake due to a reduced quantity of consumption. In addition to the quantity effect, using my ingredient regression results, I calculated what I labeled as the compositional effect, which is the reduction in calories attributable to the lower proportion of sugar in soft drinks following the tax. After determining the quantity and co qu compositional effects, I entered the reductions into a dynamic diet model from Hall et al. used to calculate long run implied weight loss from a change in consumption. These calculations yield per capita results for an average resident. I also used the proportion of people who are soft drink consumers defined as consuming soft drinks once or more per year based on the Healthy Ireland survey to determine health effects for the various average soft drink consumer. Again, this method is a rough calculation, but nevertheless may be indicative of whether the tax is relatively effective at mitigating some societal health problems or if the benefits are more negligible. In order to test if the parallel trends assumption is reasonable and to determine how prices changed over time, I ran a regression using leads and lags for both Ireland and the United Kingdom, shown in the two figures here. The month of the announcement is indicated by the first dotted red line and the month of the implementation is the second. The post soft drink variables for the first and second table are indicators for the date being equal to or after the event date and the product being a soft drink. The coefficient 
on these variables can be interpreted as the estimated effect of the event on the percent price of soft drinks. Thus, the 0 0.0132 in the left table for all prod can be interpreted as a 1.32% rise in average prices of soft drinks due to the estimated effect of the tax. The general price results are that the United Kingdom appeared to have a higher pass-through rate than Ireland did when the implementation was used as the event type. Aside from when sweets were used as the control group, UK prices for the implementation date were closer to fully shifting to the amount of the tax when compared to prices in Ireland. When the announcement was used as the event type, prices in Ireland were undershifted, but they were all statistically significant increases, whereas in the United Kingdom, increases were not significant for any of the announcement date results. This is likely due to the pre-implementation markdown in price for the United Kingdom, possibly caused by a sell-off of soon-to-be-taxed inventory at a discount. In all regressions, the percent rise in price was higher when the event type was the tax implementation, as opposed to the announcement, because both countries showed varying degrees of decreasing or flat prices following the tax announcements. Neither the United Kingdom nor Ireland had any significant results prior to the event of the date, which satisfies the parallel trends assumption. Additionally, both countries showed a decrease in the percent sugar breakdown for the soft drink category. Although they both had similar directional trends, Ireland had a much smaller magnitude change than the United Kingdom, as indicated by different y-axis scales between the two graphs. This trend for the United Kingdom was consistent with the findings from past literature. There was a slow initial reduction in sugar after the announcement, followed by a sharper decrease prior to implementation. As shown in the two tables, although both Ireland and the United Kingdom reformulated following the tax announcement and implementation, the United Kingdom's change in percent sugar content of soft drinks was far greater in magnitude, approximately six times more reformulation after adjusting to percent change rather than percentage point change than Ireland's change across all control groups and event types. Take a look here when comparing the percentage point change in sugar content relative to all other products as the control group using the announcement and implementation dates as the event type. In terms of reformulation, the UK was far more responsive to the tax than Ireland was. One possible explanation for why UK firms were more responsive is that the United Kingdom captures a larger portion of the soft drink market compared to Ireland. So a delay in reformulation in the United Kingdom would lead to comparatively larger marginal losses from an additional day of waiting than firms would experience in Ireland. This would provide a larger incentive for UK firms to immediately begin selling and producing low sugar beverages. For the back of the envelope health calculations, when looking at the total population per capita values for both Ireland and the UK, regardless of reformulation, neither pound decreases nor percent changes in BMI is very substantial. Even if we assume elasticity of demand is minus 1.4, which is the most inelastic value I included in the sensitivity table, and also above the estimated ranges reported in the literature, my price regression results only cause a 1.3 pounds per capita decrease for the UK and 0.6 pounds per capita decrease for Ireland, translating to a 0.75% and 0.31% decrease in BMI respectively. Past studies on weight loss find that in order to see any measurable health effects, it is generally recommended to decrease BMI by five to 10% and even to find statistically significant weight loss beginning at two kilograms or 4.4 pounds. When using total population per capita values, neither the BMI nor weight change are close enough to the recommended amount, which will yield noticeable health effects. Even when we only examine the subset of the population who does consume soft drinks, the weight and BMI decreases are still not enough to have noticeable effects. After incorporating sugar change and assuming an elasticity of minus 1.4, BMI decreases by 2.14% and 0.89% for soft drink consumers in the UK and Ireland, respectively. The UK's aggressive response to the tax, evidenced by large changes in percent sugar breakdown and movements in price, both initially downwards and then sharply upwards at the implementation, does lead to comparatively more BMI reduction. But both the UK and Ireland are far below the estimated 5% minimum decrease needed to see noticeable health impacts. 
Ireland had some sugar percent breakdown changes and had a noticeable but less steep price responses. Yet both countries end with minimal average per person pound and BMI reductions. To qualify this, the healthy Ireland consumption results indicate that Ireland's tax announcement had a differential impact on consumption for various demographic groups. So the tax will potentially have important health implications for some subsets of the population. Additionally, the price pass-through estimates I use as inputs may be understated because they cover all soft drinks, including SSBs and sugar-free beverages. This is the first paper to use price, ingredient, and consumption data to compare the impacts of the recent SSB taxes in Ireland and the United Kingdom, and roughly calculate the implied health effects for each country. This thesis has important implications for policymakers in the United Kingdom, Ireland, as well as globally. With the increased use of SSB taxes in recent years, policymakers should be aware that even an SSB tax that leads to clear price effects and ingredient changes may not have major health implications for the average soft drink consumer. Although certain demographic groups may disproportionately change their behavior, my rough calculations show that, on average, SSB consumers in Ireland and the United Kingdom surprisingly did not reap major health benefits from their country's SSB taxes. Going forward, researchers should continue to examine other avenues which may have greater effects on average population health outcomes, such as more structured childhood health education, awareness campaigns for parents involving the dangers of ex excess sugar consumption, or even age restrictions on consuming certain high sugar products. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. Hey everyone, my name is Tiger. Um, I'm a senior who just graduated. I am presenting my thesis here today, House of Debt Jubilee Iceland after the 2008 financial crisis. As the title may have suggested, it's a play on my thesis advisor, Professor Atif Mian's book, House of Debt. And I added the word jubilee because it's about uh, debt forgiveness, uh, what the, the jubilee that Iceland did after the 2008 financial crisis. I, the, the general idea of this paper is that we have a sense that debt forgiveness is generally understood to be helpful for economies and households to recover more quickly from financial shocks, but very few have actually been implemented at a large scale. And Iceland was an interesting case because it was particularly hard hit by the 2008 financial crisis because of its a high banking sector concentration, dramatic pre prices boom. And in response, they implemented a very generous debt jubilee uh, that amounted to 10% of its total GDP. And I basically use synthetic controls method to investigate the impact of this program and found it to result in quite substantial improvement for, for macroeconomic conditions. And ju just to give it clarify here a little bit, I, I don't mean a decline 2%. I, I mean, two percentage points. So if it were 5%, it declined you know, to 3%. That's like two percentage point. If it were at uh, 300 level, 300% at that level, then it came down to 100%. And these are all the treatment effects, meaning uh, I'm comparing these um, compared to what would have happened in absence of the Jubilee program. So in other words, we can say, uh, Iceland recovered very well after the 2008 financial crisis, but everybody recovered uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. So did the debt jubilee program actually make you recover more in addition? And these are basically the in addition policy treatment effects, meaning 2% uh, better than what would have happened, 15% percentage points better than what would have happened. The, the idea of this literature, just to, just to at, the, at the higher level about what I'm, my relationship with the overall literature. So, Atif Mian and Amir Sufi wrote this book called House of Debt, and they proposed this idea of called shared responsibility mortgages. Um, if the US had done that, the housing losses from 2006 to 2009 would be automatically more evenly distributed between creditors and homeowners, meaning the banks, you know, the creditors would also bear some losses and not just the homeowners. And had we had done that, the, the Great Recession would have only been a mild recession. That's what they, their research found. And the intuition is that when aggregate demand is falling in the economy and it, when the economy is struggling and running into constraints like the zero lower bound that makes monetary policy alone unable to solve some of those problems, it would actually very, be very helpful to relax debt service requirements for, for households. And starting with that book, there have been a series of studies 
in the macro financial literature that showed how relaxing debt payments and better risk constructing better risk sharing mechanisms uh, would be better for, for the public. So one of those papers is I'll clear it all. Um, what it showed is that if you look at different states, they have different bankruptcy protections. Um, what they basically do is that after a household declares bankruptcy, how much money are you allowed, how much asset are you allowed to keep? And if you're in a place with you know more relaxed standards, you will be able to keep more money, spend more later in your local economy and possibly boost the employment uh, and, and that's what they found. They found a positive and, uh, effect on the non-tradable sector's employment and basically used a diff and diff model, exploited that heterogeneity across states and, and found, found that better debt forgiveness programs resulted in better employment effect. And just talk a little bit about Iceland and why I chose Iceland after reading their papers. Iceland is also like a very weird economy. I mean, it, it, what it did is, before the 2008 financial crisis, it had such a, it, a highly concentrated financial sector. It's a small, tiny economy that, that nobody really hears about. You know, you think that only has fishing, uh, but but the banking sector was huge. The top three banks measured here as the bank concentration occupies 100% of the entire banking sector almost, right? So uh, for the US, that's like around 30%. For uh, other OECD countries, around 70%. Uh, compared to the other 36 OECD countries that are plotted in white, Iceland's domestic uh, credit to private sector absolutely boomed before the 2008 financial crisis, right? Peaked. Uh, likewise, with international private debt, absolutely off the charts. Uh, Non-performing loans uh, within the banking sector, off the charts. So from a financial standpoint, Iceland is a small economy, that was, but, but in fact, a financial behemoth, and it was for that reason it did very badly, you know, in the in the 2008 financial crisis, big boom, big big bust, and it enacted a, a series of debt forgiveness programs, you know, uh, moratorium of foreclosures, the, the 110 percent debt restructuring plan, uh, basically meant that they capped the mortgage loan principal at 110 percent of the collateral. The Supreme Court even stepped in and said, you know, certain. Uh, ways of, of, of uh, currency linking was illegal, which further reduced that burden. So you can see it was very radical measures. And the total mortgage write down was around, you know, 10% of GDP. The loans were, losses were borne by the banks, which were nationalized and capitalized. And then they defaulted on foreign obligations. This is now, this is almost the complete opposite of what the U.S. did. The U.S. bailed out the banks, but did not nationalize the bank. So, you know, Ray Dalio even wrote in his book that uh, this is a big debt write down followed by big money creation and modern monetary theories would, would obviously very love a lot what, what Iceland did, which we will talk a, lot, uh, a, a bit about later. But overall, just to, after giving you a landscape, what I hope to contribute to the literature is that I am also interested in the employment effect of debt relief, but what I'm bringing to the table is actually quite different from I'll clear it all, where basically a lot of the studies in, in the arena, they, what they did was they estimated diff and diff model at the local level so they couldn't actually make high macro level statements. And most of the studies on debt forgiveness programs have been you know, more cross-sectional, concentrated on regional policies, exploiting the differences between different states or provinces. And, and they want to identify the specific channels of policy impacts at the micro level. And Iceland's debt jubilee was sort of the closest macro high level implementation of Mia and Sufi's vision. So I thought it would be meaningful to examine the case from a macro perspective and the model I use, the structural assumptions I make are fundamentally different from you know, the more micro level study. So what I'm doing here is quite different. And this brings to my methodology, which is called synthetic controls method. In order to estimate the effect of the 2011 debt jubilee, you would actually need to investigate the unobserved counterfactual, right? Namely, what would have happened to Iceland's economy had the country not enacted the interventions? Uh, but but as my previous uh, summary stats graphs have shown that it's it's very hard to find a similar unit as a comparison unit as a, as a controlled unit uh, for Iceland because it was so weird right the GDP cap per capita um, unemployment rate NPL ratio private credit I mean they're all very weird uh, compared to the rest of the OECD uh, but we still want to do a macro level study what can we do in, in, as a sort of a replacement of the traditional diff and diff study, that is where synthetic controls come in. Uh, 
And synthetic controls is based on the idea that a, a combination of unaffected units, of controlled units, would yield a better, more appropriate comparison than a single affected, unaffected unit alone. So meaning, maybe a good example is Abadi et al. 2015, which estimates the effect of the 1990 German reunification on per capita GDP uh, in West Germany. So if you just use a regular population weighted sample that had all the OECD countries, that is not, the, the trend is not very, you don't have parallel trends uh, with the West Germany, but if you construct a quote unquote synthetic West Germany, uh, it would actually match very well. So this is the same idea I have for Iceland, which is that how can I take a combination of units from other countries that did not do the debt jubilee. And then I use those to construct a synthetic Iceland, which also theoretically did not do the debt jubilee. And I control that with the actual Iceland and see how they match up, right? So in my case, I'm based in, in, uh, in unemployment, I have 0.26 Luxembourg and 0.73 Mexico. And this is how their characteristics kind of match up before the treatment takes place. I mean, obviously not perfect, but much better than just using an OECD average or using Mexico alone or Luxembourg alone. So if, if you use a combination of units, you can try to plot things out and do this synthetic controls trajectory. And in here, the blue line is the actual Iceland, which did the Jubilee. The red line is the uh, synthetic Iceland, which supposedly did not do the Jubilee. What would have happened to Iceland this is what we presume what would have happened to Iceland, um, you know, had they not done the Jubilee. And we can see the unemployment rate indeed fell faster. And we can even run placebo studies, which I won't go into too much detail, but you can basically replace, uh, replace Iceland with other countries and then test things out and see if um, the black line indeed, um, which, which is what actually happened indeed, deviates a lot from the rest of the peers meaning was it actually statistically significant uh, for the policy uh, treatment effects. And um, I, I won't go into too much detail into my results, but just to quickly skim through, unemployment fell faster, GDP per capita, you know, the blue line, which is uh, uh, the actual Iceland under debt jubilee recovered faster. Uh, Non-performing loan ratio fell faster. Um, and if you run a placebo test, it's quite significant. Um, private credit, this is where territory starts to become iffy. I mean, there are some constraints to the synthetic controls methodology that I talk about in my paper. Um, it's, it's sometimes very hard to construct these good pre-trends. But overall, you can kind of get an idea that Iceland indeed recovered much faster. You know, that, that level also came down. And you can run some additional robustness checks uh, from an econometric standpoint, in, in case you're interested, using uh, cross-validation methods or synthetic difference and differences. And uh, these are some additional methodologies under the big family sort of umbrella of synthetic controls. And they're all used to uh, pr 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 provide a better alternative uh, to just the diff and diff, you know, at the, at the micro level. And I, you, you can watch YouTube videos about all these methodologies and scholars have done a great job explaining them in a very a clear way. So this is what cross-validation would look like, what synthetic difference and differences uh, would look like, which basically combines synthetic controls and difference and differences, combining their advantages. So um, overall, I think the conclusion of the paper was that compared to the synthetic counterpart, meaning compared to the counterfactual, um, uh, uh, in the absence of that jubilee, Iceland's economy did do better uh, with the that jubilee. Um, I think the policy implication is probably the, the most interesting part that we should talk about, which is if you look at the most dominant macro financial trends in the past 40 years, we have a dramatic fall in enrolled interest rates, the buildup in household and government debt, greater financialization of the real economy, um, rising inequality, all these trends. I mean, it's all happening in Iceland. They were particularly dominant in Iceland shortly before the 2000 financial crisis. The dramatic credit boom and financialization of the economy really led to a fatal crash. So it was a cautionary tale of big boom followed by big bust. But Iceland also did something very great and unthinkable, which is it enacted the debt jubilee program. It was, it was unthinkable. And this big debt write down followed by big money creation, you know, termed by Ray Dalio. I mean, it lifted Iceland from the abyss and really enabled it to actually outperform its OECD peers in recovery. So Iceland actually did it a lot better compared to the rest of the OECD countries. So I think Iceland really serves as a cautionary tale. I mean, you probably shouldn't have done <laughs> the, do the economy like that. Uh, but 
it's also a message of hope, right? If you have bold policy actions and if you construct more egalitarian risk sharing mechanisms, it would vastly improve the collective well being after a financial crisis. So, this might be on your mind, which is, is Iceland's debt jubilee modern monetary theory, right? Modern monetary theory is saying, don't worry about the deficit constraints. Uh, even some more radical version would say sacrifice central bank independence, you know, very radical high level fiscal monetary coordination that would support the economy to recover. I don't think that Iceland debt jubilee was an application of MMT. Uh, my thesis advisor, uh, Professor Mian, also doesn't think so. We think this is really just sound economic theories on risk sharing and, and debt forgiveness, meaning uh, it's just good economics and something that we've been studying for a while. I, I think the debt jubilee, you know, people, the media, and, and you can kind of interpret it like however you want, right? You can call it, we think it's good economic theory. Other people might say this is MMT. Ray Dalio would say this is a fiscal monetary coordination. Uh, Sorry about the, the spelling error here. Uh, other people might say this is some ultra Keynesian consensus that just uh, injects a lot of liquidity into the system. I mean, MMT advocates have a tendency to take credit for every historical application of those large scale fiscal monetary coordinations. And Ray Dalio wrote some of those examples that he suspect to be quasi modern monetary theory policies. Um, if you look into some of the details, you might say this is not really, this, this might be it, uh, which you can debate later. But I think a lot of times we don't wanna just draw simple correlations and not look deeply at the caveats. And if you actually look deeply at the Iceland case, I think it was just a good case of uh, good economics. Um, at the end, I just wanna say th thanks so much for uh, the Griswold Center for inviting me over and always including me in some of their events. I've learned tremendously from this research process from my mentors, uh, my, my junior paper, summer research and senior thesis advisors, many PhD students kindly helped me with, with this project and also my undergraduate friends. Um, if anybody is interested in the topic, if you want to learn more about debt forgiveness programs, uh, how to replicate uh, synthetic controls, um, how to do it in, in Stata or R, or you want the data, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help. I think synthetic controls is kind of this uh, method that might take some conceptual understanding at, at the beginning when it comes to policy um, in policy evaluation studies. Uh, but when, when it actually comes to implementing in R or Stata, it's not too uh, sophisticated. Uh, and this is the kind of macro level study that I think could be uh, good to tackle as a senior thesis project uh, for our later students. Uh, thank you so much. You may read this paper um, uh, by, by this link. I'll also put up the slides on, on the website. Um, thanks so much for listening today. Welcome to this presentation and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about my um, thesis research. My name is Tillman and the title of my thesis is Political Effects of Environmental Regulation, Evidence from the Clean Air Act. I wouldn't be here without my wonderful advisor, Professor Janet Curry, who's really guided me throughout the research process. So I'm incredibly grateful um, to her. Before I sort of dive into some of the results and econometrics, um, I wanted to comment briefly on my motivation for this topic. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, I was interested in environmental regulation and how it relates to political um, processes. And I think the reason I was interested in it is first of all that a lot of environmental regulation including the clean air act can probably have um, large welfare benefits so it's interesting or it would be good to know how we can make such policies politically feasible and keep them so as well secondly um, moving forward we will probably need a lot more regulation um, than we currently have um, particularly because of the um, you know global climate change and a lot of other environmental issues um, and finally, sort of from a more scholarly perspective, I was interested in, you know, it seems clear that political processes would impact uh, environmental policy, but it's sort of less obvious whether it would also work the other way around. Obviously, both the terms of environmental regulation and political effects are quite broad, so I had to narrow them down. So really what I'm talking about in the context of my thesis are county level classifications of air quality under the Clean Air Act. Um, and on political effects, I really mean registered voter turnout and party vote shares in federal elections. 
to provide some more context for the sort of uh, policy that I'm working with, um, I sort of made this flowchart and I'll guide you through it. So essentially the EPA um, sets so-called NACs, um, National Air Quality, Ambient Air Quality Standards, and counties have to meet those. Now, if they don't, um, they are classified as non-attainment and basically have to come up with regulatory me measures that would move them into compliance. Such measures might include plan closures, investment into newer technology, um, you know, regulations involving gasoline and the like. There's a few advantages of studying this uh, setup, which is one of the reasons that's been sort of studied a lot in the past. Um, one is that you get nice variation across time, so years and units, counties, because counties move in and out of compliance because of the setup. We also usually have many years of observations when we work with the Clean Air Act because it's been around since uh, basically the 60s. Um, and finally, what's really nice as well is that the exact regulations are not actually chosen by the counties, but they are sort of um, decided by states which means we can kind of treat them as if exogenous, those regulations, which econometrically um, is advantageous. All right, so essentially the data set that I created for this thesis sort of looks like this. This is obviously a schema. This is not actually what it looks like, but just to give you a sense, um, we essentially have here, um, you know, election years between 1992 and 2018. Um, so this is a panel data set because the second column here is supposed to indicate, you know, each county has a, a, an identification uh, number, essentially. We have several dependent variables. So again, these are either registered voter turnout or party vote shares. Here, um, we're looking at Republican, Democratic, and independent candidates. Then the deep independent variable is non-attainment designation, which is just a binary. And finally, we have um, several control variables because obviously, you know, elections are uh, correlated to many things, including local area unemployment, age distribution in the county, and so forth. I should note that we basically include almost all counties in the US with a few exceptions, um, most of which are pure controls, meaning they never enter non attainment designation, which I guess in terms of air quality is good news. Okay, so the methodology, and I won't go into much detail here, but it's sort of twofold. Um, so first of all, I implemented event study models, which I mainly use to check for a pretrend in the outcome variable, and also to examine the potential duration of any effect that we might find. So really, those are more used to motivate the second part, which is the difference in differences estimator, the context of a two-way fixed effects model. That should technically give us a causal estimate as long as certain assumptions are met. I also won't sort of discuss them in detail here, but most importantly, we have to make sure that the parallel trans assumptions hold, which we check, of course. Finally, we can get to the results. Um, the main results really are presented here. So. Um, essentially, in a naive model, um, we find no effect on turnout, which is stays the same if we include more controls. But we do find a significant increase in the vote share for Democratic candidates. This estimate given here is sort of in percentage points. So um, if we look into the second um, row here, essentially, the estimator would say that after non-attainment designation, Democratic candidates receive around 2.6% percent percentage point greater vote share. Well, this seems to be, you know, it's, it's, it's a significant number. Um, so the first question we might be asking, well, where are these additional votes coming from, especially if turnout doesn't seem to change? So the next question we turn to is sort of what happens to the vote share of under other um, candidates? And again, we find pretty much no effect on Republican candidates, but we find a significant decrease in the vote share for independent candidates. We see here in our preferred specification that estimate is around 3.8 percentage points, or 3.9 percentage points rather, um, which again is a significant effect and um, it's kind of mirrors, I think, in magnitude the increase for Democratic candidates. I want to 
briefly comment on the interpretation of the results thus far, which I think is sort of um, most likely, it seems that, you know, um, voters who don't have a strong party affiliation sort of change their preferences in favor of democratic candidates, which I think sort of indicates at least not backlash against increased regulation. Um, so the next question then we might ask, so what might correlate or predict a larger vote share shift? So what sort of gets people who don't have a strong party preference per se, maybe to more strongly favor Democrats? Um, and here sort of conceptually, I came up with two distinct mechanisms and tried to approximate them. Um, and yeah, so I wanna sort of guide you through this. So first, there could be kind of a cost-driven mechanism. By cost-driven mechanism, I mean, well, we imagine that regulations are costly for some people in particular, for example, workers that work in plants that are more highly regulated um, once a county is classified as being out of attainment. This should sort of, sort of the, sh the, the amount of people actually harmed then should correlate with how many people actually work, for, for example, in such plants, which we try to proxy for by the employment share in manufacturing. Then what I did is basically run regression specifications by quartiles of the variables distribution. And we want to sort of see between, for example, the uppermost quartile and the lowest quartile, um, is there a significant difference in how large the effects on party vote shifts are? And we find that for the employment share in manufacturing, there isn't, isn't really much going on. There isn't really much of a difference between you know, counties that have a lot of employment in manufacturing and counties that actually don't, um, which we take as evidence that that mechanism might not be particularly relevant or at the very least that we failed to capture it with this method. So then we came up with a second mechanism, which is sort of more information based. Um, the story here would go that um, certain voters might not know that air pollution is a problem in that county in particular. Um, so for those voters, the regulation sort of might not do much in terms of harming them or benefiting them, but it signals to them that air pollution is a problem and that sort of they can use that information to make their political um, or voting decisions. So to proxy for this mechanism, we use the share of college educated um, voters in a county, the idea being the more informed, the more, you know, the more educated voters are, the more likely this um, mechanism is going to make a difference. The method is again similar. So we used, we run regressions by quartiles of um, the variable distribution to see again, if there's a difference between, you know, sort of lower quartiles and upper quartiles. And here we find at least suggestive evidence that there is such um, a difference, meaning more educated counties are more likely to experience a greater vote share shift. So what are the key takeaways from all of this? Um, I think the first one really is that, you know, political consequences exist and they are not just there sort of on the local level, because here again, we're considering federal elections, even though the regulations are really more local, um, which in itself is an interesting finding, I think. Then secondly, um, you know, sort of there might be kind of good news in all of this, meaning that the level of political engagement doesn't necessarily seem to change because of the level of uh, regulation, but political preferences might, um, which again, if we're sort of worried about, you know, that it might discourage voters, um, then this is, I think, a, a good, a good, is, a, is good news, basically. And finally, um, at least there's suggestive evidence that, you know, what, what really drives the political effects is less the costs and more information. So whether a regulation makes an environmental issue more salient might determine whether people have any reaction to it at all. Now, from this, we might be able to extrapolate a few policy implications that I sort of summarized here. Um, the first one, I think, is just that policymakers, and I think political parties as well, really have to consider political consequences of environmental regulation from the very beginning. And again, this is both on the local and the federal level. Um, certainly, it's in parties' interest, I think, as environmental issues become more salient, to really consider those effects. 
The second one is that even if the costs of environmental regulation are distributed unequally, which generally will be the case, I believe, um, we might be too concerned about backlash. Backlash is sort of not a given, I think. And this leads to the third point, which is that communication, sort of information management can be really powerful tools in shaping how people react. Um, again, particularly, this seems to be the case that you know, once people understand that a particular issue needs fixing, they might be more willing to um, sort of deal with the regulations needed as well. Now, I want to point out here specifically that I think it's plausible that classification schemes are very powerful tools in doing that. So in the context of the Clean Air Act, the way the classification schemes work on a very basic level is sort of saying either you meet the standard or you don't, and if you don't, it's sort of saying you your air quality is too bad and it needs to change, which probably makes processing that information for voters much simpler than if they had to kind of do research on their own or um, deal with technical information. So really classification schemes might be quite a powerful tool in um, signaling the salience of environmental issues. Finally, if you're like me, you probably still have more questions that my thesis project didn't address at all, but that might be very interesting, particularly sort of in the next decade or so. The first one is, well, does this hold for climate change mitigation policies? Because those might be quite different for a variety of reasons. And again, since we will likely see much more of those policies, um, it would be very interesting to not know or better understand how people react to them and why. Second question I still had is, all my thesis really is saying is that, you know, we can't really, we don't find much evidence for backlash, but it doesn't mean that there can't come a point where there is backlash, right? So it could be that after a certain threshold of costs, for example, people actually do want those um, regulations done away with. And third, the data I used um, is aggregated data on the county level. So I think an interesting question to explore is what are individual level characteristics that are related or that might sort of um, mediate political reactions following environmental policy? And might, be, might we be able to sort of to tweak those? I think obviously education levels or income levels um, might be candidates here. But we, we don't really know too much about how sort of environmental policy preferences are actually formed. And I think this, again, would be a area for fruitful and policy relevant future uh, research. This brings me to the end of my presentation. And thank you so much again for um, listening. Hi everyone, my name is Aishi. I'm so honored to be here today to share my thesis research with you all. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Um, so as you can see, I did my research on the differences in statistical discrimination between the public and private sectors. And I looked at my research questions using data from ban the box policies. And I was able to do this whole project with the help of Professor Sarah Heller. She was an amazing advisor, mentor, and I'm so lucky to have been able to work with her. Um, so jumping right in, a little bit of background on Ban the Box. These are laws that prohibit employers from asking about criminal history information on the initial job application. So this movement really started in the late 1990s in response to the growing number of Americans who have a criminal record. Um, and the idea, the reason advocates love this policy is that um, a lot of employers will, upon finding out someone has a criminal record, immediately dismiss their application. So with Ban the Box, the idea is that once you remove the criminal history question, um, it 
becomes more likely that an ex-offender can pass the initial screening. Um, and then of course, it becomes more likely that they will end up being employed. Um, so this policy now exists in many different jurisdictions all across the United States. Um, these maps kind of show how it's expanded over the past couple of decades. So as you can see, it just began in Hawaii. Um, and then as of a few years ago, many different states have it. Um, from my research in particular, I focus on only the statewide ban the box laws. So those are ones enacted by state governments. And these can be classified as either public ban the box, which only applies to employers in the public sector, or private ban the box, which means that they um, not only apply to public sector employers, but also to private employers. So private ban the box has much larger coverage than does public. Um, so for my research question, the main thing I really wanted to look at is how does statistical discrimination that arises from ban the box, if any, vary between the public and private sectors? So the reason I really got interested in this question is that obviously this policy is intended to have positive outcomes for ex-offenders. It's meant to, to boost their employment prospects um, and help them succeed uh, in later life. Um, so, so, of course, it's meant to be a positive development in the criminal justice space. Um, but I read a paper by Jennifer Doliak and Benjamin Hansen showing that actually it might be the case that ban the box has pretty large negative consequences. Um, and this could be because there's something called statistical discrimination, where um, once you remove the criminal history question on an application, once you no longer have that indicator as to whether or not someone has a criminal record, um, it might be the case that employers are then more likely to assume that certain populations uh, that are overrepresented in the criminal justice system, so that is of course going to be Blacks and Hispanics, um, they're more likely to assume that these applicants are uh, more likely to have a criminal record than are white applicants. Um, and therefore that might mean that they're more likely to be less productive than white applicants. And that could of course manifest in them not hiring uh, applicants from these racial groups simply because they are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, so because this is not a matter of racial prejudice, it more so has to do with um, maximizing productivity. This is statistical discrimination and not the more commonly known taste-based discrimination. Um, so that is, of course, a pretty serious negative consequence that might arise from ban the box. Um, and this prior literature has shown that it does exist. But what I was really interested in is um, Doliak and Hansen don't differentiate their findings by sector. So it's not exactly clear whether it is public sector ban the box or private sector ban the box that's mainly driving these findings. Um, and we know that with taste-based discrimination that it can behave quite differently by sector. So I thought it might be interesting to look at statistical discrimination and see if that also behaves differently in each sector. Um, and ban the box of course presents um, a great opportunity to look at that question. Um, so the way I went about doing this is I used data from the panel study of income dynamics. This is a nationwide longitudinal survey that began in 1968. Um, I specifically used the years 2005 to 2017 because this period is when the bulk of statewide ban the box laws were passed. Um, and it's really great that it's nationwide data because um, I can compare many different types of states, um, depending on how much ban the box coverage they have, if any. Um, so I use a triple differences strategy as my main um, regression in, in my research. And I use that specifically because it allows me to test whether the effects of both public and private ban the box on minority populations, so Blacks and Hispanics, uh, statistically differ from the effects that ban the box has on whites. 
And if they not only statistically defer, but defer in a negative way on these populations, I take that as evidence of statistical discrimination against Blacks and Hispanics as a result of Ban the Box. Um, and as my main outcome variables, I chose to look at employment and labor income, and of course hoped that these two outcome variables behaved similarly, uh, so as to show that my results are robust to adding uh, an additional outcome variable. So for my primary results, um, I find that both public and private ban the box actually do have significant negative effects on Black individuals in particular. So I don't find any significant effect on Hispanics, um, but I do find that uh, for Blacks in particular, private ban the box has an effect that is nearly three times as great as public ban the box. So you can see that it's about 6% to 2%. Um, and, and both do have negative effects, but clearly private is um, much more harmful to this population. And the uh, both the public and the private ban the box effects, these are statistically different from each other. Um, and then I also looked at labor income, as I said earlier, and um, as you can see, again, it is private ban the box that has a particularly harmful effect. So it's nearly a 14% reduction relative to whites. Um, so that kind of reinforces my findings on employment, showing that ban the box does generate statistical discrimination against Blacks in particular. And um, I concluded that it is mainly ban the box in the private sector that is driving these results. Um, so if we wanna think about why this might be the case, of course it could just be an issue of coverage. As I mentioned earlier, private ban the box applies to not only the public sector, but also the private sector. So it kind of just logically makes more sense that if it applies to more employers, it's gonna have a greater effect. Um, another factor that could be contributing to this is simply differences between the private and public sectors. So the private sector is known to um, be a little bit more or, or provide employers with a little bit more discretion in hiring. Um, so that could make the private sector more vulnerable to statistical discrimination, whereas the public sector um, more so has to follow affirmative action policies and, and is regularly um, checked in terms of hiring practices. So that could uh, be providing a little bit of this difference. Um, so some broader policy implications that we might want to draw from, from these findings is, is of course the first um, main issue is that ban the box does have an adverse effect on black communities in particular. Um, the, and when I say black community, I mean the broader non-offender population, population, excuse me, of African-Americans. Um, and so the reason this is important is that when policymakers are deciding whether or not to implement ban the box, um, they should really be considering the one, the benefit to the target population, which is ex-offenders, because this is really the population that ban the box is intended to help. It, it's meant to boost the employment prospects of those who have recently been released from prison. So they want to look at is it helping this population? And then two, are there any unintended effects on broader non-offender populations? So here we see that there is quite a significant negative effect on the non-offender population. Um, and then interestingly, this is not part of my research, but other researchers have looked into what effect Ban the Box has on ex-offenders. Um, and actually, it's most of them have found either no effect or a very, very small positive effect on this population. So the takeaway from that is that there is really, to be honest, quite a small potential benefit um, that exists. And that might not be enough to outweigh the negative effect on the broader non-offender population. Um, so it really might not be worth the risk. Um, and with that, uh, policymakers might altogether reconsider passing Ban the Box, um, or at the very least, reconsider expanding 
to the private sector. So maybe if they already have public in place, it might not be necessary to also expand to the private sector. Um, and then beyond, you know, simply modifying or changing the amount of coverage Band the Box has, we can also look to complete alternatives. So maybe instead of taking away information on a job application, ex-offenders could actually be providing more information. So um, if you really go back and think about why an employer might be hesitant to hire someone who has a criminal history, it's probably because um, they are worried that these individuals might not be qualified, they might not lack uh, the character, the judgment, or the necessary skills. So if um, ex-offenders can actually go ahead and prove to employers that they have all of these qualifications and they are well suited to this job, um, that could be more beneficial to their employment prospects than Ban the Box would be. Um, and then with that, of course, if we look into programs that actually invest in boosting these job preparedness skills, that could help as well. Um, and an interesting extension, I think, of this research could be to look into how um, statistical discrimination might arise from other forms of ban the box. So um, this movement really became, began in employment, but it's now been extended to housing policies um, as well as education policies. Um, it's interesting, I actually first learned about Ban the Box because I saw that, I think it was my freshman year, I saw that students at Princeton were protesting to have our undergraduate application remove the criminal history box. Um, so it's definitely a movement within education itself. And I think it could be super interesting to look at whether there are any unintended effects um, in those areas as well, because they definitely might exist and they haven't been studied yet. Um, so yeah, that concludes the presentation of my thesis. Thank you all so much for having me and for listening to me speak. Um, it was a pleasure. Hello, and welcome to my presentation for my, on my thesis, which explored reshoring and stickiness in the apparel and automobile industries following the Trump tariffs. So the motivation behind my top, top topic is broadly with the last two decades, five and a half million Americans have lost their manufacturing jobs, which has brought bringing that back these manufacturing jobs to the US to the forefront of the political sphere. The Trump tariffs, which began in late 2018, focused on revitalizing domestic manufacturing by increasing the protection on, in particular, intermediate goods, which is important because this is quite a new piece of, of trade legislation to focus on about two thirds of world's trade and intermediate goods bringing supply chains and their dynamic to the forefront of our academic conversation. So as you can see on these two panels, these are the effect of the Trump tariffs on, on the protection faced by, by these two industries. So the left-hand side is import goods. And as you can see, there are large precipitous rises in the average tariff faced by these industries on these intermediate goods. And on the right-hand side, you can see the effect of retaliatory tariffs imposed by countries such as China and Canada on US exports. And you can see that there is some reasonable effect there too. So that leads us to the question of, does trade policy, and in particular the Trump tariffs, hold the key to returning manufacturing jobs to the United States? Can politicians use tariffs to revitalize these communities and to bring back American manufacturing and American industry? If they're not, if not, is it because of slow moving supply chains? And in particular, these sticky supply chains are quite important if tariffs are politically motivated. If, for example, a president would like to see the effects of his tariffs really kick in before re-election, does stickiness, does the pace of movement really impact whether or not they might be able to see that and whether or not tariff policy might be a wise political decision for them. And so I chose two supply chains that are quite different in my view, the apparel and the automobile industry, just to make this project feasible. And on the left-hand side, you can see a schematic of uh, uh, an Italian shoe manufacturer and, the, uh, and their supply chain, it's quite simple. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, the automobile supply chain, as you can see a lot more moving parts, um, quite uh, more uh, complex. And then just on this slide, we're comparing them. So we can see that the automobile supply chain is, is often quite fragmented. It's spider-like. Um, it's got customized complex inputs and highly specialized suppliers. And importantly, there's a very high degree of investment in supply relation, supplier relationships, 
for example, a downstream firm might share proprietary information with their supplier or ask their supplier to change their very specific manufacturing processes to best fit that upstream firm, uh, that downstream firm. Uh, and on the right hand side, you see uh, the apparel supply chains can be more sequential, they're snake like supply chains with more generic inputs, less specialized suppliers, and more importantly, less investment. And as we can see later on in this presentation, these elements might become quite important in determining how these supply chains respond to changes in protection. Um, so that brings us to the first question, reshoring. Was, this, was the Trump tariffs affected, uh, effective in bringing jobs back to the United States? And the, the broad empirical approach was to use a polynomial distributed lag model, um, looking at the cumulative effect of the of the tariffs over a 12 month structure, because um, we understand that things you know aggregate over a few months and things take time to happen, and and the variables into the into the regression were uh, looking at sort of employment as the sort of dependent variable and the four tariff of variables available from sort of replication data sets, um, which the four tariff. Uh, variables are uh, import and export tariffs on final intermediate goods, respectively. And then I just say controlled linear time trends and, and other uh, salient issues. Uh, and the results, as you can see in this table, the units are uh, a 1% change uh, in the tariff rate leads to a uh, uh, one percentage or, or, or uh, percentage point change uh, in employment across that 12 months. And the first thing to note is um, these are quite small. Um, there's overall no large effect. Um, just in particular, to explain the interpretation of these coefficient would be a 1% um, increase in uh, tariffs on parts exports led to a 0.231% uh, decrease in employment in automobile final, uh, which is broadly intuitive. But overall, we can see that the Trump tariffs had a very small effect, if any effect at all, on domestic manufacturing within this sort of 12 months period that we're looking at. Um, and so that leads us to believe why. Why did this occur? Why is it that trade policy was, as it seems, quite ineffective um, in, 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 in um, revitalizing domestic manufacturing? And that leads us to stickiness, looking at the pace at which the supply chains respond. Um, and so the empirical approach here was to look at product specific time series regressions over again, a 12 quarter lag structure, so a little bit larger. And the dependent variable was the share of imports of a particular product, which was at the HS10 level, quite specific, from a particular country. Um, and so that is you know, the share of, of uh, uh, you know, all imports of a particular product, what percentage came from a particular country in a particular month, and seeing how that varied depending on the difference between the average tariff on, all of the, on, on that product and the country-specific tariff. So if, for example, the US increased um, the tariff on, on uh, a particular automobile part from China, but kept it the same everywhere else, we might expect to see that share of total imports of that product from China to change. Uh, and as you say, we could, and as I say, we control for product and country time fixed effects. Um, and so what do we find? What did I find in terms of results? So on the left-hand side, you see how uh, these are the coefficients for the changes in share in the apparel industry over time and the right-hand side is for the automobile industry. So you can see the apparel industry is not very sticky at all. Within the first three quarters, so less than a year, um, the, the large majority of changes uh, in terms of magnitude and in terms of significance have occurred in terms of shares with the largest, most significant changes occurring immediately following those changes in tariffs. So that means that businesses are responding quite quickly. They see that the tariff goes up and within that quarter, they're making a change um, to their shares. However, in the automobile industry, it takes a lot longer. So between three to six quarters is where we see the adjustment um, in, in those shares. Um, and importantly, we see in terms of magnitudes, a far greater magnitude in parts than in final, that generally being because final goods tend only to be manufactured in a, in a, in a fair few number of places. And so therefore it's a lot harder to switch. You can't really import um, finished Toyota cars from anywhere but Japan. Um, but importantly, we can see the automobile industry is far more sticky. Uh, and so that leads us to believe that perhaps the reasons why we didn't see um, reshoring in, in these two industries is quite, is quite different. In the apparel industry, we may have just seen um, 
suppliers being switched between. For example, once the Trump tariffs were raised on, on apparel inputs, American uh, importers maybe just swapped from Chinese manufacturers to Vietnamese or, Thai, or, or, or manufacturers from Thailand. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that this might be the case. However, the description of the automobile industry is not is, is, is perhaps different. And that maybe we may have not seen an effect simply because we didn't have enough time to observe the full horizon of changes um, in the automobile industry before the COVID pandemic hit. Uh, we needed about you know, one and a half years to see a full effect. And the pandemic unfortunately arrived too early before we were able to um, fully see that in the data. So what does that mean in terms of next steps, in terms of policy responses? First off, trade policy is not a silver bullet to revitalize domestic manufacturing. Um, in some industries, it may have you know, a very muted effect total, entirely. And then uh, in other industries, time horizons ensure that tangible results uh, are not going to be attainable within the political timeline. So we think that further work, and I would suggest further work, investigates reshor reshoring in a greater number of industries and um, explores the, the switching cost associated with supply chain stickiness. So while my thesis focused on sort of the temporal aspect, the pace at which movements occur, I think further work could focus on those costs and trying to measure those switching costs, those sunk um, stickiness costs associated with supply chains. Thank you. Hi, my name is Raymond Chu, and I'm honored for the opportunity to present my research to the Griswold Center. My senior thesis was on the limits to arbitrage and shock transmission in the repo and federal funds market. And I used qualitative and theoretical analysis, as well as a Bayesian structural vector autoregression for empirical analysis to better understand these short-term funding markets. I'd like to give a special thanks to my advisor, Professor Moritz Lennel, for his invaluable guidance and advice throughout this research process. The motivation for my research centered around trying to better understand the mid-September 2019 repo crisis. So on September 17th, 2019, the tri-party repo rate spiked to 9% from its weekly average of 2%. And as a result, the federal funds rate inched above the FOMC target rate. On the same day, the Fed responded by injecting 50 billion plus of liquidity and continued open market operations in the repo market until summer of 2020. While this was not commonly reported in the media, it represented a very significant issue for financial plumbing. And as a result, I had a couple of research questions that I wanted to dive into. First was just confirming whether shock transmission occurred between the federal funds and repo markets. And second, if so, I wanted to understand which agents matter in explaining how spikes can blow out of proportion like they did in September 2019. So a, a little bit of context about the repo market first. A repo transaction is an agreement between a lender and a borrower where the borrower sells a collateral security to the lender and promises to buy the collateral back at some premium, often the next day. The repo rate is then the implied yield from the sale and the repurchase price of the collateral. In my research, I focus on treasury repo where treasury securities are used as collateral. And I focus on the tri-party repo market, which is called that because there's a third party involved, a clearinghouse. So the benefits of, or of uh, using the tri-party repo market as the base for my analysis is that one, there's just more data available. And two, it's where the bulk of money market funds participate in the repo market. So um, it's more interesting from an agent perspective. As we can see from the Federal Reserve overnight reverse repo facility, the Fed is an increasingly active participant in the repo market as well. And this is reflected in how the Federal Reserve sets its policy rate ranges. So as we can see from this, um, the federal funds rate is range bound by uh, t historically the interest on reserves as well as the overnight first repo facility. So when it spiked and broke past this target rate in September 2019, 
Um, it suggested that there must be some issues with financial plumbing and the ability to correct. Uh, typically, we would expect rates to be rate differences to be arbitraged by different market participants. So the fact that it did not suggests potentially um, that there are limits to arbitrage in these short term funding markets. To better understand how shock transmission occurs and who is involved with sort of uh, the normalization of spreads in these markets, uh, we utilized a financial variable, the repo spread, which we defined as the repo rate minus the federal funds rate. So as we can see, um, this repo spread is really negative during the great financial crisis, which makes sense because um, the federal funds rate is unsecured. So uh, it was relatively more risky than repo lending. At the same time, um, in September 2019, as well as in 1998, during the long-term capital management uh, crisis, the repo spread was strongly positive, which suggested issues with financial plumbing and the ability for broker dealers to intermediate these transactions. So my methodology was to use a high frequency identification approach to evasion structural vector autoregression for an empirical analysis of these markets. So the data that I used um, first my high frequency indicators were monetary policy surprises updated from uh, Gary Naksak right 2005. So in these monetary policy surprises are essentially three month federal funds uh, futures contracts. And we took the contract quote 10 minutes before an FOMC meeting and 20 minutes after that FOMC meeting. So we got 170 data points as a result. And these surprises uh, are supposed to reflect purely whatever the Fed communicated during FOMC meetings, because we assume that nothing else has changed in the world during that time period. Uh, and then we have a policy rate indicator, which we use, at, uh, which we use the one-year T-bill rate for. And then we use the repo rate, which was a survey um, gathered by the Fed um, and its transactions with primary dealers. And then for our macro variables, we use the excess bond premium, the log of real GDP, which we disaggregate um, into monthly data using a Kalman filter, and then the log GDP deflator. Um, so our fundamental approach is actually quite simple. We use just sign restrictions on two high frequency variables um, to identify uh, two shocks. And we define these shocks as negative and positive shocks uh, used also to, or as policy and information shocks. Um, so the policy shock is strictly when the Fed um, just raises rates, which is supposed to have a negative, a contractionary effect on the economy. Uh, information effect suggests that the Fed is communicating very positive information about the economy um, and is raising rates to kind of preemptively avoid overheating. And so it's when the markets or stock market is increasing um, at the same time that the Fed is increasing rates, even though historically there's kind of a negative correlation between stock prices and uh, interest rate increases. So from this analysis, we get a clearly identif identified change in the repo spread in response to the policy and information shocks. So the repo spread immediately moves in opposite, in opposite directions it moves negative in response to a policy shock and positive in response to an information shock. Um, also, based on how the responses kind of filter out over the time horizon that we use in our BAR, there's evidence of just overcorrection in the funding markets before equilibrium is restored. These results are significant because one, um, the shock is pretty clearly identified, and two, um, it suggests that depending on the type of information that is conveyed from FOMC meetings, 
the different agents that participate in the repo and federal funds markets are going to position or react differently. And so the more qualitative and theoretical part of my research was to understand some of those drivers. And while I will not dive into kind of the first uh, order model that I built uh, to kind of model out these short-term funding markets, um, I, there are some lessons that we can take away contextualized to the repo crisis in 2019. So fundamentally, the repo crisis blew out of proportion because of leveraged market participants seeking excess returns. Um, the kind of nominal or notional causes for the repo spike uh, are not unique events like tax um, payments um, and end of quarter kind of adjustments typically do not cause spikes. But when leveraged market participants are seeking excess returns and are in need of cash financing, they're willing to pay at a higher rate. At the same time, money market funds acted irrationally, likely to preserve their broker relationships, which also served to exacerbate the crisis. Banks actually had sufficient excess reserves to arbitrage all the differences in kind of these markets, but did not supporting the existence of limits to arbitrage. It also suggests that banks desire a minimum of uh, 2 trillion in excess reserves because that was the amount that they did not want to breach and the reason why they did not really arbitrage um, in September 2019. In the federal funds market, the over-reliance on federal home loan banks um, makes the market generally just less indicative of borrowing risk when these banks kind of pulled out of participating in the market uh, because of the uncertainty, because like due to the repo kind of spike. Uh, the market as a whole just like stop functioning properly. A couple of policy implications we can generate from this analysis, few general implications. First is that regulation makes funding markets less efficient and more in need of Fed intervention. This isn't making a claim as to whether regulation is good or bad, but rather that there, that there is regulation means that limits to arbitrage exist and make it difficult for markets to self-correct. Um, repo data is also really limited um, and that adds to the kind of opacity of the markets and makes it kind of difficult to understand. Additionally, the federal funds rate is an increasingly irrelevant indicator uh, because it has the least market participants um, and the banks, which used to comprise a much larger proportion um, and just like total volume in the markets, basically do not participate anymore. Um, so it's unclear what the Fed is trying to achieve by focusing on creating different policy tools that target the Fed funds rate. There are also some upcoming policy decisions that would benefit from a better understanding of how these shocks transmissions um, operate. So how the Fed achieves its liftoff and balance sheet normalization uh, requires a keen understanding of liquidity and this kind of amount of bank reserves that the banks want to hold. Uh, then in July, the, there was their newly approved net stable funding ratio. Um, and that basically increased the requirements um, for uh, stable funding or stable kind of assets for repo lending, which obviously makes um, is it makes kind of the ability to arbitrage even more difficult. And then finally, the Fed is very active with their reverse repo policies right now, um, as they try to drain liquidity from the system uh, while they're still participating in open um, in like se treasury security purchases. So. Uh, how all of these kind of different market components fit together remains to be seen um, and requires a strong understanding and therefore more research should be done in the repo market um, in understanding the repo market and understanding how exactly these kind of shocks propagate and 
but my research was a good starting point in that it shifted from the traditional kind of event study analyses that scholars do due to limited data and used kind of a novel high frequency approach where you're able to see kind of just like more data points about how the repo market responded to shocks. Thank you for listening to my research and please follow up if you have any questions. Um, thanks again for your time.